In the Buddha's description of the factors of the path, the factors that are associated with concentration are three. Right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And they interpenetrate. Right effort becomes ardency when you practice mindfulness. And the establishings of mindfulness are the topics of concentration. And it's in the fourth jhana that mindfulness becomes pure. So they're very closely connected. And when you're doing concentration, it's important that you work on all three. Now, one of the important elements of right effort is your motivation. In Pali, this is called chandang janeti, generating desire. And sometimes when you sit down to meditate, the desire is there. It's no problem. You get right to the breath. As John Lee says, the breath is our home base in meditation. But there are other meditation themes that are, as I said, places where the mind goes foraging. And these are mainly for motivation. There are times when it, you don't want to settle down with the breath. You don't feel up to it. You, you get discouraged, or you're lazy, or other moods invade your mind. And it's at times like that when you need other meditation themes to help you convince yourself that, yes, you do want to be with the breath. There's a set of four meditations. They're called the guardian meditations. And the first one is recollection of the Buddha. This is a theme that's good for times when you're feeling discouraged, or your conviction is weak. You ramp up your conviction by contemplating what kind of person the Buddha was, and the fact that we live in a world where someone has found true happiness through his own efforts. that he was willing to teach that those lessons he learned from it, what, he, what he had done to everyone who was willing to listen. And he taught them for free. We walked all over India, where someone needed to learn the lesson, he went there. And as he said, the qualities that made him able to find that true happiness are qualities that we all have in potential form. something that we need to develop them, and developing them is something we can do on our own. Those facts have lots of implications for all of us, both in terms of the sense of the world in which we live and our sense of ourselves. The sense of ourselves, of course, is that we have it within us to find true happiness. So when you think about that, you wonder about the other things you might be pursuing, the other pleasures you might be pursuing. And what are they in comparison to the, the happiness of the deathless, something that doesn't change, something that doesn't require anything base or ignoble in pursuing it? Of course, in the sense of the world, given the range of the different kinds of happiness we could go for. Why don't we go for the best? Because the best is possible. Those are the main features of what it means to think about the Buddha. But you can also go into more details. You read up on his life, see the inspiring example he set. And you realize that this dharma that we're practicing comes from a really good person. Here he was, a prince destined to rule with all kinds of wealth, all kinds of pleasures. 
and then gave it all away, abandoned it. You can think of rich and famous people nowadays. How many people would do what the Buddha did? Can't think of anybody. People are too easily intoxicated by their wealth, by their good looks, by the possibility of power. And here was someone who saw through all of that. His life is marked by three main qualities. There's his wisdom, his compassion, and his purity. And so he, the way he found happiness involves those three qualities. And those are the qualities that he then used in his, in his teaching. You think about how many different kinds of happiness in the world would in, involve those three qualities. That something that would be, have to be wise, you'd have to be compassionate, you would have to be pure to find them. They're not that many. All too often the kinds of happiness we search for in the world involve things that are not wise, not compassionate, and not pure. So you can think about the Buddha as an inspiring example to remind us of this is a good path, it's founded by a good person, and it makes us good people in the pursuit of it. As the Buddha said, wisdom begins with the question, what when I do it will lead to long-term welfare and happiness. The wisdom lying in the one realizing that true happiness has to come from your actions. You can't just wait for it to come floating by. And then too, long term is better than short term. It's a simple principle, but it has lots of implications. One in terms of the compassion. If your happiness depends on the suffering of other people, they're not going to stand for it. It's not going to last. If you want a lasting happiness, you have to think about the well-being of others. That's compassion. And then you really have to carry through. You look at your actions again and again and again to make sure they don't harm yourself, don't harm others. Before you do the action, you ask yourself, what do you anticipate will be the result? If you anticipate any harm, you go, don't do it. While you're doing it, you check to see if any harm is coming up immediately. It's not all actions wait until the next lifetime in order to give the results. You spit into the wind, it comes right back at you. You stick your finger in a fire, it burns right away. So if you see that you're doing something that's having bad consequences, stop. Don't see any bad consequences, go ahead, keep with it. And finally, when it's done, you look at the long-term results. If you realize that you did, in spite of your anticipation, cause harm, you talk it over with someone who's more advanced on the path, and you resolve not to repeat the mistake. If you don't see any harm, you can take joy in the fact that you're progressing on the path. That, the Buddha said, is how you find purity. So the Buddha was a person of wisdom, compassion, and purity, both in the way he looked for the happiness and then as a result of the happiness he found. That's what he compelled him to teach, marked his teachings, and those are the qualities he teaches to us. So when your conviction in the path is beginning to flag, it's good to stop and think about him and the Dharma that he taught. That's just the example that he sets for us. We live in a world where someone has done this. It's possible. And we're people who can do that. If you find the example of the Buddha a little too far out of reach, in other words, you don't feel that you're up to this. You can also reflect on the Sangha. There are stories in the canon about monks and nuns who were desperate, 
had lots of difficulties in the practice. There was one monk who was going to commit suicide. People had all kinds of difficulties in the practice, but they were all able to overcome them. You can think about that. If the Buddha seems super, superhuman, some of these monks and nuns seem all too human. And yet they were all able to gain awakening. You reflect on the fact that you're not nearly as bad off as they are. If they can do it, so can you. That kind of reflection helps you overcome doubt about yourself. So if you find that one of the problems in your practice is doubt either about the practice or about yourself, reflect on the Buddha, reflect on the Sangha, reflect on the Dharma. And you find that you can actually get the mind to settle down. As the Buddha said, these reflections can actually lead to the first jhana, which is the first level of right concentration. Especially after you've been thinking discursively about the Buddha. You can boil everything down into just one word. Bhutto means awake. Just repeat that to yourself. That that's the quality you want to develop in the mind. And you think of every cell in your body saying, Bhutto, Bhutto. If your distractions are really insistent, you can pump it in rapid fire like a machine gun really fast. Bhutto, Bhutto, Bhutto. There are lots of ways you can vary this practice. If you find the mind settles down by thinking about these things, then you can finally put thoughts aside and get back to the breath with a much greater sense of energy, a much greater sense of confidence and conviction. Having generated a desire to do what the Buddha did, after all, he gained awakening while focusing on his breath. And that's the technique he taught more than any other. But even if you do find it easy to settle down with the breath, it's good to stop and reflect every now and then just on the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as a way of maintaining your energy, keeping your, keeping your practice up, not only when you're doing formal meditation, but as you go through the day. We live in the world where there is a Buddha. There's a story in the canon about Ananda Bindika, who eventually became one of the Buddha's main lay disciples. He's visiting a friend, and the friend is engaged in getting ready for a meal that he's going to present to the Buddha and the Sangha the next day. Ananda Bindika comes and asks him, what's going on? You have a wedding? What's the big, what are all the big preparations? And the friend says, presenting a meal to the Buddha tomorrow morning. And immediately on hearing the word Buddha, it's like a lightning bolt strikes and then a Bindiga. He says, it's very rare to find that in the world, someone who's really a Buddha, someone who's really awake. And for those of us, we've heard his name many times. It's good to stop and think how amazing it is. We live in a world where someone has found awakening through his efforts and teaches that path to everybody for free. So why not take advantage of the path that he taught? 